Arizona, over a hundred thousand square miles of mountains, desert, and plains. Raising cattle is the big business. Right now it's in pretty bad shape. A drought started early in the year, streams and water holes have dried up. That's why Red Connors and I are here. Herb Doherty, an old friend of ours who went into the banking business after he made a rich gold strike, had sent for us. He's in Little Rock Basin, the cattle raising center of Arizona. drought and Little Rock Basin will bust wide open. Yeah, there's no use worrying about it. Maybe not. But if the cattle business goes under, that'll mean the end of the Cattlemen's Association. That's right, Steve. Seeing you'll be out of a job with the rest of us, you're taking this mighty casual. Look, we'll all have better jobs if what I'm figuring on works. What do you mean? Well, you know Dougherty's been shelling out money hand over a fist since before enduring this drought. Well, everybody in town knows that. Well, the normal rainy season's just about over, right? Right. If the elements don't fool us, he'll have to go on carrying these cattle until late in the fall. It'll take more money than he has to do that. Exactly. In 30 days' time, he'd be flat broke. The bank's assets will be sold at auction, and I'll bid him in on a dime on the dollar. He control all the cattle and grazing land in the basin. All right, suppose it works that way. How do we feed and water the stock? Well, we'll do what the cattlemen can't afford to. We'll sell the stock for whatever we can get. If it's only $10 a head, we'll make plenty. Yeah, I guess you're right. And it won't be long before this drought's forgotten. New herds will be brought in. Remember that the grazing fees won't be anything to be sneezed at. The day we rode into Little Rock, the weather was hot and dry. There still hadn't been any rain. Lack of drinking water for the animals brought home to us that the situation must be more serious than we thought. the cashier, we heard him telling the two men at his window that Doherty had instructed him to put $5,000 more into each of their accounts. And as I told you before, I'm not forgetting that you cattlemen grub stake me time and time again. So as long as I have the money, you're all welcome to it, Gail. See the cashier, he'll fix you up. Isn't this turning out to be more than you bargained for, Doherty? Not at all. I have faith in Little Rock Basin, and I have faith in you cattlemen. I'll go along with you to my last dollar. Now get out, I'm busy. Thanks. Didn't you hear me say that I was... <laughs> Hoppy! How are you? Red, how are you? Well, you got here fast. We didn't waste any time when we got word you wanted to see us. Yeah, this newfangled telegraph's a great thing. It sure <laughs> is. Well, uh, sit down, both of you. Thanks. Well, you seem to be doing pretty well here. What's your problem? Well, I, uh, I don't know just how to explain the situation I'm in. Well, suppose we start at the beginning, huh? Well, after I made my strike, I wanted to do something for those that helped me during the lean years. Yeah? Well, opening a bank seemed the best way. The cattle industry was growing. The cattlemen needed money to increase their herds and land holdings. <laughs> I let them have it. <laughs> Oh, it's wonderful you feel that way about the cattlemen. But what do you know about running a bank? Oh, shucks, there's nothing to it. You just lend money and take notes and mortgages. 
I have a stack of them that high. <laughs> but the banking business isn't that simple. You have to know the value of land and cattle in order to protect yourself and your depositors. I've been trying to convince Daddy of that for a long time. Daddy, oh, how are you? Hey, she's pretty as ever. <laughs> Hello, Reggie. It's good to see you, too. I have an idea you were responsible for that telegram we got. You're right. I'm worried terribly. Worried. Now, Pat. Please, Daddy, let me talk about it. From the little I overheard, I, uh, I know Dad hasn't told you what's wrong. So I will. It won't take me long. In a few minutes, Pat explained how things stood. Her father and the bank were land poor. They practically owned Little Rock Basin. Doherty had been generous to a fault. Now he would have to continue advancing money or lose what he had already invested. I asked Doherty if he had tried to raise money on those mortgages and notes. He told me out-of-town banks wouldn't lend a dime on grazing land in normal times. There was no use trying during the drought. Of course, as a last resort, the cattle could be sold, but the buyers were aware of the conditions in Little Rock Basin and wouldn't hesitate to take advantage of it. So that was ruled out. Doherty was plainly discouraged. He'd been letting his friends down, and that, to him, was a crime. Suddenly, I had a thought. I put it up to them. Why couldn't we drive the cattle to where feed and water was plentiful? It wouldn't be easy. It'd be a long, hard drive, but it could be done. That's the answer, Hoppy. Where will you take the cattle? To the Twin Rivers Range. We got plenty of feed and water there. How about the cattlemen? Will they agree to have the herds move that far? Well, I don't think they have much choice if they want to save them. But we're going to have to move fast. Leave that to me. The roundup will start as soon as I spread the word around. You'll trail boss the outfit, Hoppy. Thank you, Herb. So long, Patty. Bye, Hoppy. Bye, Pat. Bye, Red. The cattlemen, without exception, were in favor of the plan. They set their crews to work rounding up the herds. In search of food and water, the cattle had roamed far and wide. Frank Walton? Yeah, I am. My name's Cassidy. I'm a friend of Herb Doherty. Well, he told me he's expecting you. This is Steve Buckley. How are you? Glad Howdy. to know you. I'd have dropped in sooner, but I've been helping round up the cattle over in Little Rock Basin. They were scattered all over the country. Doherty thought maybe your men could help give us a hand. Well, sure, sure. Be glad to send them over. Well, that's fine. Have them report to Charlie Gale over in the East Range. As soon as you can. Uh, but why are you moving the stock now? We're going to graze the herd of Twin Rivers. There's plenty of feed and water there. Good idea. We thought so. Thanks again. We gonna let the cattlemen get away with that? Uh-uh. We're just gonna let them think they are. It took two weeks of hard work to round up the cattle and get the drive underway. We figured it was better not to push the cattle, just let them amble along. They had a hard trip ahead of them. Well, they don't seem to have very many men for the job. Yeah, they're short-handed, all right. It's a break we need. It's rough country the other side of the pass through the mountains. Yeah, that's the spot I picked. The men will meet me there later. Well, while you're taking care of things out here, I'll get busy in town. The cattle kept moving along slowly but steadily. We were making better time than Red and I had thought possible. Steve and Jack's men will hit him from the other side and from the front. We'll hit him from here.
Not expecting anything like this, we were caught flat-footed. There was no chance of stopping a stampede or catching any of those responsible for it. The cattle would have to run themselves out, and the hard work of rounding them up would have to be done all over again. Doherty and the cattleman would have to be told, so Red and I decided to have a talk with the boys, then go back to Little Rock. We'd stopped at Gale's ranch on our way back to Little Rock and found we weren't the only ones with bad news. Gale's foreman told us Doherty had been shot by an unknown assailant the day after the drive started, that he was alive but in critical condition. To make matters worse, word had gotten around that he had tried to take his own life the bank was in bad shape and about to fail. This started a run on the bank and Pat had sent for Gail and Walton. Red and I didn't want to miss that meeting. Patty, I'm convinced. That the shooting of your father, the stampeding of the cattle and the run on this bank all happening within days of each other isn't just coincidence. It was planned. But why? That we have to find out. If the run goes on tomorrow, we won't have enough cash to carry us through the day. Wait a minute, tomorrow's Saturday. You'll only be open two hours from 10 to 12. I know that, but I still don't think we can do it. Uh, that would have given us the whole weekend to try to get to the bottom of what's going on here. Has Dad used the money he put in my account in the Colfax Bank? No, he wouldn't touch that under any circumstances. Then we won't tell him. Hoppy, when Dad sold his mining claims, he put $10,000 in the Colfax Bank for me. I'll telegraph the bank to put it on the next stage. Well, that'll be Monday afternoon. Today's stage is already left. If I use that old trail through the mountains, I might be able to get to Colfax and back before the bank opens tomorrow. Hoppy, if you only could. Telegraph the bank and tell them to have that money ready no matter what time I get there. You do it. Right. We'll bring in as much money as we can scrape up tonight. Fine. The money had been waiting for me in Colfax, and by mid-morning, I was well on my way back to Little Rock. Another hour or so, and I'd be there. right in the middle. How many more men were waiting for me along the trail, I had no way of telling. My best bet seemed to head for rough country. I decided not to take any chances of the money falling into wrong hands. If luck was with me, I could pick it up later. money away from me gave me an idea. I believed if I played my cards right, I'd get to the bottom of things. It was gonna be tricky, but I felt I could handle it.
Ted, you're all right. I was afraid of something like this. That's why we rode out. Well, we didn't get here any too soon. Yeah, a few minutes later, them hold-up men had the money. Hold-up men? Money? What are you talking about, mister? Mister? What do you mean, calling me mister? You know I'm Red Connors. Now listen, Hoppy. What did you call me? Now look, I'm getting mad. Hoppy's short for Hopalong Cassidy. Hoppy? Hopalong, I never heard of him. Now listen, we haven't got time for this foolishness. We got to get into Little Rock with this $10,000 you brought from Colfax. $10,000? Colfax? I know. Well, we caught up with you before the men who were chasing you did, so you must still have it. Well, I... I haven't got it on me. Say, maybe you've got me mis mistaken for somebody else. I don't know. Now, listen, Hoppy, this has gone far enough. If you ain't Hopalong Cassidy, who are you? Well, I'm... I don't know. He must have fallen from his horse and knocked his memory loose. Yeah, he must have. How about backtracking? Well, it's no use in country as rough as this. Our only hope's to get him into town and see if Doc Weatherby can do something to get his memory back. Come That's on. That's right. All right, boys, you better get him inside real quick. Better go over to the bank. I'll be right back. Red was worried about the situation at the bank. I was too, but I figured he'd work things out there. Besides, I had to go through with when I'd started. Ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven. Right. Uh, sign this, please. One moment, please. Uh, please check this to see if the amount's correct. There's enough cash left to pay it. Quit stalling. I want my money. I'll have to ask them to wait until Monday morning. They'll put the place down. Maybe not. Where do you think you're going? I gotta see Miss Doherty. Not a chance. Look at that clock on the wall. One minute till closing time. Get back to the end of the line. This bank ain't closing as long as I'm standing on my feet. Maybe you ain't gonna be on your feet in about a minute. Yeah! <laughs> seconds before 12 o'clock. Could. Bring in some lunch, too, will you? We're going to be working all afternoon. Right. The medical term for loss of memory is amnesia. It isn't dangerous, but I don't believe there's any known cure. Well, maybe the doctors don't have any cure for it. But I heard that if you... Can... coming over here. There was no excitement outside the bank. This was a good sign, but I knew Pat not being aware that I had faked the loss of memory must be dreading having to face an angry bunch of people on Monday morning. Hey! Pat was angry. She didn't mince words bawling right out. He defended himself, saying he'd heard that another blow on the head might bring back my memory. Finally, they both ran out of breath. This gave me a chance to tell them that I hadn't lost my memory and that the money was safely hidden. Then I went on and pointed out that only four men knew about me going after the money. The cashier, the telegrapher, and the two who were with Red. One of them must have planned the attack on me. Red agreed, but Pat was doubtful. 
She insisted they were all friends of her father. They wouldn't harm him. I hope she was right, but I was almost sure she wasn't. There was only one way to find out. I put that up to her. Pat listened carefully. She questioned me a couple of times. I answered her a satisfaction, and she agreed to spread word in strict confidence to each of the four men that I had recovered my memory and was going after the money. I didn't leave town until after Pat had spoken to the four men and emphasized to each that he was the only one she was telling. I spotted somebody trailing me. I didn't try to see who it was. I stopped and pretended to be looking for a certain spot to give whoever was following me time to close in. Cold chills were running up and down my spine. Even with the precautions I'd taken, I knew there was a chance a slug had ripped right into my back any minute. Earlier, Red had staked himself out near where I was to pretend to look for the money. Lucky for me, he'd been right on the job. We immediately recognized Buckley as one of Walton's men. Walton had sent him to watch me and make certain I didn't run off with the money. He was lying and we knew it. There was no doubt in our minds that Walton was the man we were after. So we decided to take Buckley back to town and try to figure some way of proving it. I handed the money to Pat and told Red to check and see if Walton was in his office. Then I told Buckley to act as though the money was in the saddlebags. in them cattle men. Red, if more men had the faith in people that he has, this world would be a much nicer place to live in. Yes, it would. Say, when he gets well enough to travel, why don't you bring him over to Twin Rivers? Bar 20 is a nice, peaceful place. Well, we'll do that. As a matter of fact, we'll probably be waiting for you when you arrive with the cattle. Cattle? That sounds like a gentle hint for us to go to work. Sure does. We'll see you at Twin Rivers. been washing your face and hands good lately? How about your ears? They look pretty good. Don't forget that soap and water not only keeps you nice and clean, but it also protects your health. So use lots of it, won't you? I'll see you next week. There goes on his way down the 
the moonlit trail to where cowboys rest. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then.